Hey, really quick, if you haven't had a chance to go over to heroparanormal.com, please do. For the price of a boutique cup of coffee a month, you get all the content behind the paywall, and there's a ton of it. You can also access that at Patreon. Just search for Hero Paranormal. And if you're listening via YouTube, please, please, please like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Because although I will most likely never be monetized on YouTube for a variety of reasons, the truth being one of them, if you like, share, and subscribe the podcast on there, at least you help me break through the algorithm of control. The shadow ban is real. Enjoy. Off in my time machine, third eye feeling like it need visine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine, third eye feeling like it need visine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Blast off on a very illuminating episode of the Hyper Anomalous Esoteric Research Organization podcast, aka. Hero Paranormal, broadcasting from the base at La Madre Mountain, just south of Area 51. My name is Ryan, the paranormal pontificator of the airwaves, bringing you an illuminating and insightful episode today. We are going to be discussing none other than the amazing Rosicrucian and a man considered by many to possibly be immortal. We are talking about someone who was purportedly born in 1710, and his name was the Count of St. Germain. He was quite the interesting fellow. He was the third son of Prince Ferenc Rokosi, the second of Hungary, and apparently he wasn't quite sure who his mother was, or at least those around him didn't know. It's believed that he was raised by the Medici banking family. Everyone knows about the Medicis, and they were very wealthy, a family who supported the arts. However, no account seems to be without its blurriness. In other words, no one knows his origins for certain. There are no birth or funeral records of the Count of St. Germain. And although he went by the Count of St. Germain, his real name is unknown. He was a very real historical person, and he's undoubtedly one of the most amazing characters in our history. Many, many, many individuals considered him not only highly elite and part of the aristocracy, but by all accounts he was an alchemist, a Rosicrucian, and a member of the secret society that, many believe, not only control the world, but also built it. St. Germain's closest confidant was Prince Carl, and he was the only man to whom he seemingly told some information, for example, his parentage. And it is purported that he is the man in which whose home St. Germain chose to die, at least one of the times. And I know that sounds crazy to say that or even consider that possibility. However, many of those who knew him best believed he was either immortal or continuously reincarnating over and over into this world. Because that we know of, the majority of those close to him believed he was at least 300 years old. And he was seen before, and purportedly seen since. Now, I've really wanted to ask Crow777, another podcaster, his belief of what really took place with the Count of St. Germain, because he claims to be allegedly in contact with one of his family members and only and last living kin, 
This family member, I've heard him talk with Crow777, and he sure sounds like the real deal. He goes by the name of Fortune, the Saint Germain, and he seems to also be an alchemist who is able to navigate the mysteries of life with ease. But getting back to his ancestor, Count de Saint Germain, the question often arises, how did he seem to live for so long? and live so well. Is it due to his Rosicrucianism? Many attribute this to the possibility that he was a student on the path to soul illumination via the mystery school known as Rosicrucianism. He had selected a definite goal and achieved it, and he knew his desired destination. If he was, in fact, willing to adopt the laws and the guide to right living, right acting, and living life with less effort, needing less sustenance, being able to reincarnate with more ease, and basically living a life that would otherwise be impossible. Shouldn't we all be doing the same? It has been said that if one wholeheartedly enters into the study of these mysteries... They will, by the very nature of these studies, become so absorbed in them that they will forget all the wrongs they may have been nursing. They will forget time and effort, and time will blur. It will subside. Time is not a human creation, and time is something we only bind ourselves to through our objectives. So did the Count of St. Germain find a hack for time? It certainly appears so. Some believe his 300-year lifespan was nothing, that he had been alive for thousands of years. Pretty, pretty wild claims. Of course, he became very notorious in the circles of Europe, especially those of aristocracy in 1742. He became a spectacle of sorts. He knew just about everything, about anything. He was a great conversationalist, a jeweler, a painter. He seemed to have his fingers in all of the arts, history, science, math, music. He spoke many languages, including Greek, Portuguese, Russian, Chinese, Latin, English, Dutch, Spanish, French, German even purported that he understood Sanskrit. And how is this all possible? Many purported that aside from always having priceless gems in and around him, oftentimes wearing them in his clothing and in the form of jewelry, he claimed to not only be an exquisite jeweler, but also an alchemist, and purportedly had the ability to turn lead to gold. It appeared that there was a lot, too, the Count of St. Germain. Now, a countess by the name of Vong Georgi, an elderly countess, became very enthralled with the stories of St. Germain. She went to a party and met the Count. They spoke, and it appeared that he was the very same man she had met years ago, and that he had not aged a day. She was curious because she recalled meeting someone who looked exactly like him, an incredible man by the same name in Venice in 1710. She asked the Count if it was perhaps his father or grandfather. The Count was a happy and simple chap, and he smiled and just acknowledged her in her age and said, Ma'am, I am very old. He also acknowledged that it was him who had met her at the end of the last century and that it was a pleasure to be speaking with her again. Keep in mind, he appeared to be in his 40s at this point. She was shocked. The renowned 18th century philosopher Voltaire had a great deal of respect for all that the Count of St. Germain did. He said that he was a man who never dies and who knew everything. 
1774, the Count of St. Germain allegedly warned Marie Antoinette that a revolution was coming, and it did. There are many cases like this. He moved to Russia in 1762 and was said to have been involved in quite the ordeal which granted Catherine the great throne. He later was an advisor to the commander of the Russian army in a war against Turkey. He was an extraordinary man. He had an assured manner, and many believed when he told them he was 300 years old. It seemed that he knew a lot about medicine and would often make concoctions for people who were sick. Many believe that there was a startling resemblance between the Count of St. Germain and actor Kevin Pollock. The actor is aware of the comparisons, but does not confirm or deny the allegations. If I was in the business of Hollywood, I would probably not confirm or deny the allegations either, although we have seen Mr. Pollock get older through the years. So this is something that the real-life purportedly immortal Count of St. Germain did not have an issue with. He seemed to be able to not only maintain his good looks, but also his vitality and health. And when it came to the women, oh man, you did not want to be in the same room as the Count of St. Germain. The guy had game. Not only was he dressed in the most amazing of linens and material, but much of his clothing was often adorned in very expensive gems and diamonds. According to Casanova, which kind of uh, thought himself quite the ladies' man as well, you didn't want to be in close proximity to the Count of St. Germain because he would steal the show. Casanova was very intimidated and noticed that the Count really did draw the room, and every woman who was eligible in his area was definitely with their eyes locked on him. Casanova did not like this, so that just goes to show how much game the Count of St. Germain had. But let's get back to the health kicks, because immortality is a serious game. And apparently, he had quite the diet. In fact, I have, in my research, tracked down many old books and accounts of what it is exactly that the Count of St. Germain drank and ate, although it is still a mystery because many of the accounts are, well, they're kind of pre-sorted. And what I mean by that is people are making speculations and theories, and these are people that were close to him. They believe that he was mainly on a diet of oatmeal and that he drank a reddish tea beverage. However, some have purported it may have been human blood or at least had a little bit mixed in with it. And this may come from the possibility that he is from royalty, royalty from Transylvania and of the draconian bloodline. Now, let's keep in mind that this is a real guy. There are real historical accounts of his presence at various times throughout history, going back as far, believe it or not, as Christ, and that he was there and present when Christ performed the miracle of turning water into wine. Now, it's interesting that he seems to be at these places where these miracles take place, and he seems to have a great deal of knowledge when it comes to alchemy. Seemingly, he was able to turn common materials, such as lead, into gold, and could take smaller diamonds and turn them into bigger ones. These are unnatural feats, to say the least, if not bordering on magic, and miraculous in and of themselves. Interestingly enough, the magic area of St. Germain is possibly the most appealing to me because he has many accounts of people who believe he may have even been Merlin of King Arthur's court. And before you scoff at that idea, keep in mind that there is more historical account and proof that Merlin existed than King Arthur himself. So that's a kind of a big deal. And magic was sort of what Merlin did. He was said to have figured out and known about the Philosopher's Stone. 
and he was able to create projection powder, which is a valuable, intrinsic, alchemical potion of sorts. Powder, I guess, but it can be mixed with water. Some purported he even drank a little bit of this in his nightly concoctions, in the beverages that he drank, and this could have something to do with his secret immortality. Projection powder is also one of the key ingredients, if not the key ingredient needed in alchemical manifestations of turning metals such as lead into gold. So it is a key component to many of the most magic alchemical recipes. Now, St. Germain was said to have learned much of his jewelry craft in the Middle East, and he spent some time in the court of the Shah of Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Now, keep in mind that the Safavid dynasty, which ruled Iran from 1502 to 1736 AD, amassed what could be considered the most dynamic jewelry collection of all time. And the crown jewels were absolutely stunning. Diamonds and gold, the splendor of the collection, came to the attention of the world largely through their use by Mohammad Riza Pahlavi and his Shabunu Farah Pahlavi. During official ceremonies and state visits, no one could believe their eyes. The Iranian crown jewels are considered so valuable that they are still used as a reserve to back Iranian currency. So it does appear the Count of St. Germain did learn from the very best. Which would make sense because many were amazed that he could affix rubies, emeralds, and diamonds to his clothing. I mean, these are priceless gems attached to clothing which could easily fall off. However, the elaborate crowns, tiaras, and numeral bejeweled swords and shields, which could be found in the Shah of Persia's court, as well as more unusual items, such as large golden globes, oceans made of emeralds, it seemed that the very best jewelers on the planet learned how to elaborately place diamonds and emeralds, rubies, in not only silver, gold, but other items as well. So he learned how to do this fine art of jewelry making and of fixing these amazing precious stones and gems to clothing itself, something that which fascinated his elite guests and those who he would run into at dinner parties, and he only mixed with the very super class, the power elite of the time, the aristocracy. So to be able to impress them, you really had to uh, have something next level. You really had to have something that even they were awestruck by. But setting jewelry was not his only talent. He was very educated. He seemed to know something about everything, or a lot about everything. And his education baffled these elite friends that he would make, and even they would be astonished at his references and everything he knew, his his travels. Now, he was also very capable at music. He could paint, he could play the violin, and many have believed that he may have been one of the famous composers, maybe even Francis Bacon as well. He has a list of pseudonyms and possible archetypes and characters which many believe he played throughout history, just assuming the role that they were about. Some believe he was Shakespeare himself. And again, back to back to the talents They seemed innumerable. He seemed to be able to do anything he put his mind to and do it well. As rumors go, many claimed he was ambidextrous. And whether it be fencing, painting, fighting, or even just writing letters, he could compose two letters at the same time, writing them both as skillfully as the other. Amazing feature to have is this amazing ability to utilize both hands in ways that others could only utilize one. Of course, if you're immortal, many of these gifts and treasures, these abilities would come naturally over time. 
centuries have a way of making good pupils of the education of regular individuals. So is it possible that just his amazing amount of time on this planet is what lent so many amazing characteristics to his abilities? I don't know. What is interesting is that many claim to have met him at different times in their lives and purportedly said he appeared the same. He had not aged. He was the same looking individual that they had seen in younger years. Of these, possibly the most impressive happened in 1760, when a very aristocratic countess known as Countess von Georgie met the Count of St. Germain and realized she had met him earlier in life. Yet he looked exactly the same. She was an older woman at this point and seemed flabbergasted. When asked if it was him or if it may have been his father, the Count said, Yes, it was I, and seemed very humble about the ability to keep his youth. She had met the Count in 1710, which was a stunning 50 years before. So when she saw someone who resembled the same person, she was floored. She couldn't believe her eyes, and she attested that it was the same individual. However, the Countess wasn't the only one who had known of St. Germain living in Venice in the year 1710. He was witnessed by many in that area and appeared to be the same age. Although at this particular dinner party, the Countess was sure that this was the same individual and he had not aged a day. It really did seem that he had abilities other human beings just didn't have, and possible immortality appeared to be one of them. There do seem to be various times during the Count of St. Germain's life when it appears he faked his own death, And this is only because some of those that he trusted to help him in the process came forward with these ideas and information. Now, what's odd is he often would leave his fortune behind, apparently to just make a new one. And he was witnessed doing this by at least two people, possibly more. So, why is it that he seemed to be able to fake his own death. Well, back then it must have been much easier to fake your own death. You just left everything behind, you found a body, or what's left of one, and um, had some friends pitch in to help you set up a funeral and make all the arrangements, and you disappeared. With the Count's ability to make fortune, make gems, turn lead into gold, and things of this nature it seems possible that he would go to other places, reestablish, make a new fortune, and move on with his life, thus not having to explain his age. It seems one of these great moves was done after he was 300 years old, because he was getting a lot of notoriety for being 300 years old, and for hanging out in more or less the same circles in Europe. The secret was out. People knew. What was he to do? And this was uh, quite the quandary. He would obviously have to be a master of many alchemical processes to make this happen. But he did fake his own death, purportedly, by some of those who were closest to him. Where things get really interesting is when one starts to realize the majority of the times he was seen... He was dressed in opulence, hanging with the most elite of circles, whether that be in the Middle East, in Europe, or even purportedly in the Americas. That's right, the Count of St. Germain was reportedly seen at the signing of the Declaration of Independence in the United States of America. So when did all this immortality start? Well, according to friends close to him, he said he learned the keys to universal health and possibly immortality itself on May 1st, 
Beltane of 1684. Now, if that's the case, when was he born? And who were his parents? This is a mystery. In my opinion, the closest guess is outlined in the book The Secret of Kings, a monograph of the Count of St. Germain by Isabel Cooper Oakley. She asserts through her genealogical research that he was born of Francis Racozzi II. And here come the rumors of being part of the draconian bloodline, because as we all know, Dragul or Dracula was from Transylvania. And according to this genealogical research and reporting, the Count of St. Germain's father, he was the Prince of Transylvania in 1690. And 1690 is purportedly when the Count of St. Germain was born, at least according to her research. Now, keep in mind that Vlad, the Impaler, or who many know as Count Dracula, was alive between 1448 and he purportedly died in 1477. But many claim his line is the line of the dragon, the son of the dragon, Dragul. Dracul is also akin to the word devil. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Just because people are from Transylvania doesn't mean they're Dracula, line of the dragon, or have something to do with the devil, right? I would hope not. But it definitely adds to the mystery. And man, oh man, is the Count of St. Germain a man of mystery. He would often drop hints wherever he was seen that he was indeed centuries old and that he could quite literally, quote-unquote, grow diamonds. He never ate in public, and although, as far as anyone could tell, quite the ladies' man, he was indeed totally celibate. He often made prophecies, which people could not believe, and he would, purportedly, spontaneously teleport to distant locations and has been seen bilocated, in other words, in two places at the same time. Many consider the Count of St. Germain to be one of the hidden immortals or ascended masters who manipulate history throughout time. Possibly my favorite story of the Count of St. Germain is having to do with his purported existence when he was located in New Orleans. And he supposedly attacked a woman. According to the urban legend surrounding St. Germain, he has reappeared throughout history in New Orleans, having never aged. The attack in New Orleans of a woman on a balcony is perhaps my favorite, because it was the early 1900s, and a mysterious, mysterious man arrived in New Orleans under the name of Jacques St. Germain. He was entertaining, extravagant, had gems on his clothing. He seemed to be the very same Count de St. Germain people had witnessed throughout time. Jacques de St. Germain is said to have taken residence at the home located at 1039 Royal Street. He was apparently quite wealthy and quite the ladies' man. He was frequently seen with beautiful women on his arm. Interestingly, he would always have the most elite friends over at his dinner parties, where he rarely, if ever, ate. His parties were a big deal, and especially in the upper echelon of society. Where things started to get a little weird is that after his arrival to New Orleans, Jacques de Saint-Germain claimed in essence, that he was a direct descendant of the Count of St. Germain. His claim started to kind of raise eyebrows. People were aware that this was not normal. And then people began to notice that it may actually be the Count of St. Germain himself. People noted that portraits 
never really showed the Count of St. Germain being older than about 40 or 50 years old, which is exactly the same age that Jacques de St. Germain appeared to be. Let's just say that people got to talking. Rumors spread like wildfire. And Jacques apparently seemed to enjoy the mysterious gasps that he would get when he crossed people in public. He would joke about being immortal. And he relished in his guests' amazement of him. The satisfaction he offered and the beautiful parties and feasts seemed to make all of the strangeness go away. However, something happened. Police were called to St. Germain's home, and there was quite, quite the scandal. They were there to investigate a woman who had seemingly fallen from his gallery, a full story above. This woman, who was rumored to have been a prostitute, had in fact leapt from his balcony. And this balcony is pretty far up there. She jumped. Jumped for her own safety, according to her. While she did survive, she was terrified. And when people in the street surrounded her and came to her aid and asked her what had happened, her story was hard to believe. She said that she had jumped to escape Jacques de Saint-Germain himself. She claimed he had, in fact, attacked her and bitten her neck and tried to take her blood. Now, Jacques de Saint-Germain was very affluent, wealthy, well-respected. Surely his word versus that of a common street prostitute would hold more weight. Everyone knew this. However, when he was asked to come down to the station to answer some questions, he said sure. But he said he'd rather visit the police station in the morning to go over the accounts of the evening. With such a reputation, being so affluent in the area and owning such an amazing piece of real estate, they surely thought he wouldn't run. However, the next morning, Jacques de Saint-Germain was gone. In fact, he had completely vanished. He left the majority of his belongings behind. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the many times Saint-Germain relocated. He would leave it all behind, pack very light, and disappear. According to the urban legend, when the police broke into his house, they were very cautious. On the second floor of the home, they claimed they discovered a series of open wine bottles, but they were closed, sealed from the outside, obviously resealed. Some other substance had been placed inside them. They were not the original substance. What they claim was in those bottles was an interesting concoction of red wine along with human blood. Questions remained unanswered. How could someone leave so much behind? Not only his stash of wine and human blood, but jewels, gems, ridiculously beautiful wardrobe, and a mansion on Royal Street in New Orleans. Well, so much mystery and speculation, yet no Saint Germain. He had vanished into thin air. And no one, absolutely no one, saw him leave, knows where he went, because he quite literally disappeared. Which brings me to the reality of, who was Saint Germain? A vampire? A saint? A prophet? A time traveler? An ascended master? Some in the European court claim that they saw him walk through mirrors, that he could quite literally transport himself as if through a portal, if he had the properly placed body-length mirror in a corner. This is the kind of alchemy and important magic which lends a lot of credence to the urban legends of him being able to disappear without a soul seeing or hearing a thing. One of my favorite accounts that I came across was during his travels when he was looking 
for different types of work through the courts of Europe as a scholar. St. Germain had found a woman who he liked very much, and through their conversations he quickly mesmerized her with his travels, tales of all the adventures he had had. Let's just say it didn't take long for her to fall head over heels for this amazing man with a mysterious background, with all kinds of talents, highly educated, seemingly able to do all sorts of things that the regular guys couldn't do. Just as things were getting to be too good to be true, it got wildly, wildly magical. And by magical, I mean unbelievable. Where she became amazed was when he once walked towards a mirror in a corner and said, don't be scared, I'll be back soon. And he purportedly walked through that mirror to disappear completely. Now, I mean, this is just one of the stories that make this guy one of the most significant characters in history, I believe, and by far one of my favorite characters in history. This guy has it all. He, he has something for everyone. There's magic involved, there's alchemy, there's politics. There's the fact that he's a Rosicrucian. He's also a Freemason. And his background is absolutely stunning. And, you know, these just keep on going. Uh, there's purportedly so many different adventures achieved by St. Germain that it's hard to tell which are far-fetched claims and which are true. He is said to have made the the last wild claim of being as old as 500 years old. And this was to Voltaire, who dubbed him the Wonder Man, and that he was a man who could not die and who knew everything. Now, what's interesting is Prince Charles, Hesse Cassel, is recorded as having called him one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived. But this is not even his strong point. People rarely consider him a philosopher. He's everything but. But it just goes to show how well-rounded he was. And his title, Count of St. Germain, it's almost very interesting. Like, the, you know... and. We don't know because we believe, at least those who have studied deeply into his genealogy, believe that he was a son of Francis Rakosi II, the Prince of Transylvania. And this would account for his wealth and, of course, fine education. Oddly, the will of Francis II Rakosi mentions his eldest son, Leopold George. Now, what's strange is Leopold George was believed to have died at the age of four. However, there is a lot of speculation that they hid his identity and safeguarded where he was at all times to protect him against the persecutions of the Habsburg dynasty at the time because there were many who would have wanted him gone. So this could all make sense. You know, they could easily have transported him elsewhere, keep, kept his identity hidden. When his father died, his will and testament would have carried on to him. What's interesting is if he was born in 1691, when his father, Francis Rakosi II, was 15 years old, then it would make sense that later in life, for example, when St. Germain told Prince Charles that he was 88 years old, this genealogy would line up. The numbers don't lie. He told Prince Charles of Hesse Cassel that he was 88 years old. And therefore, if you place his birth at 1691, this would add up. The 88 years would make sense mathematically. Some of the mystery can be solved in, in some of this math. However, he was supposedly educated in Italy by the last of the Medicis, who were also steeped, steeped in ancient mystery schools, private parties. As you know, the Medicis were an extremely wealthy family who supported the arts. They were very involved in the occult. They had mysterious lore of their own, 
and they were very safeguarded. I mean, no one knew everything about the Medici's, which adds to the mystery if they, in fact, helped educate him. St. Germain was believed to be a student at the University of Siena. Siena is one of the most remarkable cities in Italy. And it seems as if he did kind of spin a web of lies to confuse people about his actual origins. In other words, he would go by different names and pseudonyms in different places throughout his history. According to David Hunter, a researcher, the Count of St. Germain contributed to some of the songs on La Inconstanza de Lusa, an opera performed at the Haymarket Theater in London. Apparently, he was very musically inclined and could not only write the works, but also play them. He also began to use, with consistency, the title of the Count of St. Germain sometime in the early 1740s. And he was even a purported spy at least twice. Although I'm sure he got away with it many more times than that. Purportedly, the Count of St. Germain was arrested in London on suspicion of espionage. This was during the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. He was released without any charges. The news read like this. The other day they seized an odd man who goes by the name of Count St. Germain. He has been here these two years and will not tell who he is or whence but profess two wonderful things. The first, that he does not go by his right name, and the second, that he never had any dealings with any woman. He sings, plays the violin wonderfully, composes, is mad, and not very sensible. He is called an Italian, a Spaniard, a Pole, somebody that married into great fortune in Mexico and ran away with her jewels to Constantinople. Some say a priest, a fiddler, a vast nobleman. The Prince of Wales has had an unsatiated curiosity about him, but in vain. However, nothing has been made out against him. He is released. And what convinces me that he is not a gentleman stays here and talks of his being taken up for a spy. This writing was from a letter by Horace Walpole. As amazing as Walpole's writings about the Count of St. Germain are, they don't hold a candle to the memoirs by Casanova. And I'm going to read the memoirs and the notes in which Giacomo Casanova describes the marvelous Count of St. Germain. And he writes, The most enjoyable dinner I had was with Madame de Robert Giorgi who came with the famous adventurer known by the name of the Count de Saint-Germain. This individual, instead of eating, talked from the beginning of the meal to the end, and I followed his example in one respect, as I did not eat, but listened to him, and with the greatest attention. It may safely be said that as a conversationalist, he was unequaled. St. Germain gave himself out for a marvel and always aimed at exciting amazement, which he often succeeded in doing. He was a scholar, linguist, musician, and chemist, good-looking, and a perfect ladies' man. For a while, he gave them paints and cosmetics. He flattered them. Not that that would make them young again, which he modestly confessed was beyond him, but that their beauty would be preserved by means of a wash, which, he said, cost him a lot of money, but which he gave away freely. He had contrived to gain the favor of Madame de Pompadour, who had spoken about him to the king, for whom he had made a laboratory, in which the monarch, a martyr to boredom, tried to find a little pleasure or distraction, at all events, by making dyes the king had given him a suite of rooms at Chambord and a hundred thousand francs for the construction of a laboratory. And according to St. Germain, the dyes discovered by the king would have a materially beneficial influence on the quality 
of French fabrics. This extraordinary man intended by nature to be the king of impostors and quacks would say in an easy assured manner that he was 300 years old, that he knew the secret of universal medicine, that he possessed a mastery over nature, that he could melt diamonds, professing himself capable of forming, out of 10 or 12 small diamonds, one large one, the finest water without any loss of weight. All this, he said, was a mere trifle to him. Notwithstanding his boastings, his barefaced lies, and his manifold eccentricities, I cannot say I thought him offensive. In spite of my knowledge of what he was, and in spite of my own feelings, I thought him an astonishing man, as he was always astonishing me. I honestly think Casanova may have written the best memoir of the Count of St. Germain of anyone, even Voltaire, and he had an amazing group of friends, which consisted of the cream of the crop of society, elites, aristocrats, poets, authors, royalty. The list went on and on. The truth is, none of them could hold their own when it came to hobnobbing the way the Count of St. Germain did. Although the Count of St. Germain purportedly died and was buried in Germany, there is some astonishing possibilities that this did not take place at all. In fact, when people went through his things, which there was a public auction selling all of his possessions, there were no jewels, there were no gems, nothing of worth, and his violin was gone, and other things that people know he would not have left behind, which makes many wonder if he died at all or if it was another situation of him pretending and faking his own death once again. His purported death happened February 27th in 1784, and it was recorded in the register of the St. Nikolai Church. He was buried on the 2nd of March, and the cost of burial was listed in the accounting books of the church the following day. The burial site was there at Nikolai Church. He was buried in a private grave. And what's odd is Prince Charles donated the factory where he purportedly died to the crown. And it was afterward converted into a hospital. But, as mentioned previously, this is not the last we would hear of the Count of St. Germain. He seemed to pop up all over the place, all over the world. And the most recent account of St. Germain was in 1972, where a gentleman who very much looked like St. Germain was found and did not deny the claim that he was, in fact, the Count of St. Germain. It happened, of course, in Paris, one of St. Germain's favorite cities, and a man named Richard Chanfrey said, Yes, I am, in fact, St. Germain, the Count of St. Germain. Where it gets interesting is that Richard Chanfrey was a magician, which would fall right into line with one of the talents of the historic, mystical Count of St. Germain. He was very much publicly known. Everyone knew about him, and he very much appeared to be in his 40s or 50s, early 50s, late 40s, as was always described. And he also looked a lot like many of the images, reliefs, and paintings. So this started to get a little strange. Here we have a person who's publicly known, he's in the public eye, He comes forward saying, I am the Count of St. Germain. What on earth would compel him to do this? Nobody knew. But it was not easily accepted. People immediately started to question him. The more they questioned, the more he barked back that he had the abilities which he claimed, including 
that he could transmute lead into gold. Well, let's get real for a minute. 1972 is definitely more modern times. We have science now. We have ways we can analyze and test these claims. You can't just come out and say this stuff and not be able to perform it, right? So what did he do? He offered to perform it. Not only perform it, but perform it on live television of all places. He also became more famous than he already was. People started to ask him for psychic readings. He would mysteriously give people prophecies and divinations, and he seemed to hit his mark. He was extremely popular among celebrities in France, and many of the wealthy and elite would invite him to castles. Interestingly, he would claim that he had been there before, and when he arrived, he would explain the layout as it was when he visited the last time. He was usually spot on. And when he did change lead into gold on French TV, it is claimed there was no trickery that scientists checked the metal before and the metal after, and that it was appraised as actually being gold after he transmuted a strip of lead wire in his crucible over a camp stove of all places. Things were just heating up, and they got a lot stranger because he seemed to have more talents than anyone could shake a stick at. And speaking of sticks, he actually even walked with a cane. Talk about big-time pimping. He didn't need the cane, but he just walked with it. It was a style accessory. Not only that, he showed the cameraman on the TV show that the cane would open up and was actually a firearm. That's right. It could shoot. He was eccentric to the max, just like the Count of St. Germain. He also drove an American sports car, something which was exotic and wild for France. He drove a Corvette, and he dressed with such splendor that he would appear to be a real-life Count of St. Germain. And he dated only the finest women. Although we don't know much about their relationships, it was interesting. He dated a famous French singer and was actually even featured on a song with her and sang extremely well. Where things get wild is that he passed away in 1983, so it's impossible to dig deeper into Chanfrey or the modern version of The Count of St. Germain. However, if you want to hear the song with Richard Chanfrey, the star that he dated was named Dalida, D-A-L-I-D-A, and you can find the song online, Dalida and Richard Chanfrey. Quick Google search and you get this relaxing nature video with peaceful music, and it's extremely stress-relieving. Cheesy? Absolutely, but very much in line with what you would expect. Of course, the modern Count of St. Germain, Richard Chanfrey, also had his strange connections and incidents with the law. He was also kind of an outlaw, because he did have to spend one year in jail and pay 118,000 francs in restitution to a man who he found naked in his kitchen at the late hours of the night. Although the man was only superficially hurt, he did have to spend the time for the crime. Dalida and St. Germain, or a.k.a. Richard Chanfrey, broke up. They separated. But he quickly became a lover of the Baroness Paula de Luz. Deleuze seemed to be a millionaire and lived that lifestyle in every sense of the word. Chanfrey and Deleuze disappeared for quite some time. They did appear, however, in public at a party in St. Tropez. This was in June of 1983. Chanfrey, a.k.a. St. Germain, seemed to be very skinny. 
and he seemed tired, according to those who saw him. Oddly, the 21st of July of 1983, in a town close to St. Tropez, Chanfre and De Luce committed suicide. They seemingly inhaled exhaust fumes through a tube from a running vehicle. And Chanfrey left a suicide note. Interestingly, it read as follows. I'll leave and I'll bring her with me because she is so like me. Was this another stunt by the Count of St. Germain? Had he faked his own death again or was this a legitimate death? No one really knows. What we do know is the secret of St. Germain has been kept hidden and there is now supposedly kin of St. Germain, descendants of St. Germain. As mentioned earlier in the podcast, there is a man who is known as Fortune de St. Germain, who appears from time to time on Crow 777 radio podcast, and he handles himself quite well, much like you would expect from the lineage of St. Germain. Really quick, if you haven't gone over to HeroParanormal.com, please check it out. For the price of a boutique cup of coffee a month, you get all the content behind the paywall, and there's a ton of it. Also, you can access that through Patreon. Just search for Hero Paranormal. And if you're listening via YouTube, please, please, please like, share, and subscribe the podcast. That will help me break through the algorithm of control. The shadow ban is real. Until next time, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evising. Blast off. Blast off. Blast off. Blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evising. Blast off. Blast off.